Hi, I'm Steph Turner. And I'm Gabe Weiss. And Gabe and I are developers here at Perforce, in the trenches, writing code just like a lot of you. Gabe, have you noticed how fast products are getting developed and released these days? It's killing developers and forcing us to come up with better ways to handle stuff like code quality and the merge hell and experimentation and feature creep. Sure, but on the flip side, it's actually been really cool to watch all of the new workflows, branching strategies, and tools getting used to get the product out the door faster. Well, we've definitely felt it at Perforce. But it's been exciting and challenging to make sure that our customers can use our product smoothly with the development and branching style that works right for them, whether their business is built around waterfall, agile, latest trend, continuous delivery, you know, whatever. Gabe, as you know, I don't follow any particular style and I do whatever works for me. So most of the time I like working in my own dev branch and that's why I was totally stoked when Perforce, Perforce came out with his lightweight task branches. Um, I thought it'd be fun to share some of our firsthand experience in using task streams so that everyone can see why we think they rock so much. Absolutely, you bet. All right, uh, if we're gonna talk about task branching, I think it's worth taking a quick look at what's actually going on under the covers when branches get created in Perforce. Right on. All right, a uh, code base with 100,000 new files creates 100,000 file archives for the content and 300,000 revision records of metadata. Uh, creating a branch adds 300,000 more revision records and two integration records for every file revision, one to keep track of the source and one for the target of the intent. And that's 200,000 integration records. And But remember, the archive files are lazy copies. So until a file is actually changed, there's no content overhead for creating that branch. Yeah, but Gabe, you know that these records get created for every branch, even if you don't change a single file in that branch. Yep, and all of that metadata is key to tracking the relationships between the branch files. That's what makes Perforce branching and merging smarter and safer, which rocks for developers like us. But more branches means more metadata, and more metadata means longer table locks. Right. Eventually, down the road, you're going to take a performance and administration hit. So you're either looking at upgrading your hardware or slapping your developers with stricter branching policies. And if you slap me with a stricter branching policy, it's going to cause a massive disruption to my workflow since I do all my coding and testing in private branches. So hardware upgrades aside, one way to get you the freedom to branch is to make a lightweight, disposable branch that still gives the same comfort and security of a regular branch, but doesn't bloat your tables with unnecessary metadata. All right, so before Perforce added task streams, uh, there were two popular techniques used to make branching more lightweight, uh, overlay mappings and obliterate. Let's look at overlay mappings. Uh, they're also referred to as plus mappings. It's actually a two-pronged approach that involves branching a subset of the code and then using a workspace mapping to overlay that subset onto the parent branch. Uh, it definitely reduces the amount of metadata and that's going to help server performance. But I gotta tell you, I've used plus mappings and completely hosed my workspace. I was treated to twisted client maps, disappearing files, I ran down a rat hole chasing a bug through the overlay and original branches. Getting a good fix on the source revisions branch point through two different branches moving at different rates is a total labor of love. I punted on that. Well, the other option is to use the obliterate dismembering technique. Uh, basically, this technique slices off uh, any of the uninteresting metadata and obliterates it. Let's check out the slides. Uh, if we highlight the interesting files and metadata, it makes it really easy to see the surrounding bloat. Okay, so then I just run obliterate, chop out the uninteresting stuff, only the good stuff is left. But you have to have permissions of a king to use obliterate, and that's not an option for everyone. Plus, most developers would be too scared to use obliterate as a routine part of their workflow. And then Perforce came out with Streams. Streams puts your code into a special container with a set of best practices and flow of change conventions built right into them. This makes it really easy for developers like us to get up and running and stay on track with getting the right code to the right place. Gabe, you own P4V Stream, and that means you get to control which files go into the stream, the permissions of the files, and all the users that can access the code in the stream. So pretty much anyone coding on P4V has to play by the rules that you set up for the stream. Mm -hmm. So Steph, turns out right now, P4V team's working on adding Swarm into P4V. So we needed to use some of the server and Swarm code. 
Yeah, I was kind of uh, skeptical that the servants' warranties would let you touch their code. Well, we didn't actually need to touch their code. We just need to link it in and use the headers. In fact, I didn't want any of the P4V developers accidentally changing the server swarm code. So I configured the P4V stream to import the swarm and server code. Dude, import totally rocks. Here are the three things about using the stream's import director directive. First, it lets you set up the server and swarm code as read-only in the P4 of read stream without mucking with the protections table. So this was great. Import serves as a lightweight protection scheme for me without having to have special admin privileges. Yeah, and I bet that made the force admins happy. Uh, second, import makes sure that the P4 stream automatically gets the latest version of the server and swarm code without any developer having to remember to integrate the latest code into the stream. Which is way cool. Keeping that team up to date without extra work cuts down on those surprise last minute kill emerges that destroys the schedule. Right, and third, none of the imported code adds extra revision and integration metadata into the tables. And that means we're not taking a hit on performance for using the code that we're not changing in our stream. It's all good. Yeah, and hopefully the admins will leave us alone and let us branch. But seriously, Gabe, the real win for me is that the server generates my workspace based on the stream spec that you set up, and I never had to touch a client mapping file. Woohoo! Plus, I don't even have to worry about your workspace map getting stale when I make changes to the stream spec, because workspaces will automatically get updated when the stream spec changes. Mm, yeah. But here's the deal, though. I still have some concerns about working straight out of a shared code line. You know how sometimes when you're making the changes to the older or more complicated parts of the code, it can take a few times to get it right? Well, whenever the lower level files get touched, it can trigger massive recompiles, and it takes a long time to build, link, and test. So I really don't like the idea of pushing off my intermediary check-ins onto the rest of the team if it's going to force these massive recompiles. Yeah, I hear you on that one. Sometimes I just use a, a shelf for a quick fix. Yeah, the shelf is great, but even for relatively uncomplicated changes, anytime I touch more than a few files, it's easier to manage my staging, merging workflow, and testing in a branch. That's why I suggested you cut a dev stream off the P4V stream. And I did that, and I was completely amazed how fast and painless that was. I think it took two mouse clicks because the defaults were great. And getting your code to and from the parents a no-brainer since the stream graph gives you a very guided path with lots of visual clues and reminders of how and when to merge and copy. But there are some catches with using dev streams. I'm still incurring a metadata and performance hit for any unchanged files I bring into the dev branch without using import. You could go into your dev stream spec and import those files. Really? You think I'm going to do that? Uh, it's just a suggestion. <laughs> yeah, the other issue is that I haven't really found a clean and easy way to get rid of the dev branch when I'm done with it. If I mark the files for delete, they sometimes come back to haunt me as unintegrated changes. And if I try to reuse the branch, the disjointed history makes it harder for me to use the uh, debugging tools like RevGraph. It eventually becomes a nuisance to deal with all of those non-active branches hanging around also. Which is exactly why you need to start using the new task streams. Short-lived development, it's perfect. Task streams pretty much address all of those concerns. Demo time. All right. Okay. So it's unbelievably easy to create a task branch in P4V. So here on the stream graph, you can see, here's Steph's dev branch that she's been using the whole time. But now I'm going to create a new task branch for her. So I can click off the main line, create a new stream for main, give it an appropriate name. And then note, under the type, we now have this new type for task. It creates a lightweight branch used for bug fixes and new features. Boom. Everything else I can leave the same. I'm going to not create a new workspace. I'll show you why in a sec. But go ahead and branch the files. Do it. And now here you can see I have created her new, her new task stream. So now I'm going to do something a little sneaky. I know Steph doesn't like managing multiple workspaces. So I'm going to drag her development workspace over onto the task stream. And her files will be automatically updated. And she's good to go. Steph, your task branch and workspace are all set for you. No freaking way. That was way too simple. I don't believe you. Well, OK, but look, here are all the files. So it's just as easy to create a task stream as it is to create any other stream. And you can reuse your workspace just like any other stream. But you know, there has to be a difference, or we wouldn't be doing this talk. So let's sneak on back over the slides to show exactly why it's different. All right. 
So this is what a regular stream looks like with its revision and integration records. The task branch still adds rev and integ records, so it's not entirely free. But notice the records get added to this shadow set of DB tables, not the main tables. This way your task branch doesn't bloat and impact server locking and performance for the rest of the, the developers that don't care about what you're working on. That's cool, a shadow table. Hmm. Well, what's the catch? Where's the cost? Uh, here, it's gonna be easier to show you. Let me go back to the P4V demo and I can show you. So in P4V, I can see the entire, uh, the entire task stream as long as I'm in a workspace that's connected to the task branch. But if I switch my workspace, let me go over to my task stream, task stream, you'll notice that step task is gone. It's disappeared from it the basically it looks like it's gone. That's because any of the files that are in that task stream only exist in the shadow table. So if I'm not in a workspace of that task stream, I can't see them. So you pay a little price in global visibility, but it's not that big a deal since it's supposed to be a private branch anyway. All right, smarty pants, when does everyone else get to see the changes? Technically, change files in the task stream are visible. What's not visible to others are the files that haven't been changed. Dude, you think I have a clue what you just said? Let's go back to the slides. <laughs> okay, here we go. So, this is how the file archives, rev and inted records, initially get distributed between the shadow and those real tables. The task files are only visible to workspaces connected to the stream because the records are only in those shadow tables. You with me so far? Yeah, kind of. <laughs> Stay with me. So once you edit a file, a few things are going to happen. The archive file gets created, and the new rev records get added to the shadow tables. Then the rev and integ records will get copied into those real tables. The only records that get copied from the shadow tables to the real tables are the records for those changed files. All right, so what you're saying is that once it's in the real tables, that's when it becomes visible to everyone? Mm -hmm. well, let me see what that looks like in P4V. Okay, so here we are back in P4V. We're gonna go back and work in, uh, I, I can go show it in mine, that's fine. So here I am in mine, I'm gonna make a change to folder diff. Okay, check it out. I make my fix, I'm all done. It's an awesome fix. And I'm gonna go ahead and submit it. So, now remember, if I'm in a different workspace, I'm not gonna see the, un the unchanged files, but I will see the changed file. So I'm gonna switch back to your task branch. And you'll see now, I have only the changed files in my task branch visible. The rest of the files are gone from the depot tree. Mm hmm. 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 Wait. Wait. Oh my God. That's really cool. <laughs> you think they're gonna let me? You think they're gonna let me create branches now? Maybe. Hey, wait. But what happens if I underestimate the work? I don't do that a lot, but sometimes I do, and uh, I end up changing more than half the files in my task stream, and I'm still not done. I, by my calculation, I'd be carrying all of the records in the shadow tables and the real tables, and that's gotta be worse than having a regular dev branch. Uh, can I punt on the task branch and go back to using a regular dev stream? Mm -hmm. So once you've changed half the files in the task branch, you're better off using a dev branch, because remember, you're duplicating those rev records in the shadow and the real tables. Fortunately, you've got a one-time, get out of jail free card. The task stream can be converted to a different type of stream. There's some rules around which type of stream you can change it into, uh, but the dialog will guide you through that. But remember, once it's converted, no going back. I can show you how easy it is on my task stream if you want. Sure, go ahead. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and edit my task stream, change it from type task, type development, leave everything else the same, click OK. I'm being prompted because remember, one-time operation. Once you do this, you can't go back. All of those shadow table revision records, when you convert, will get changed into real records on, or at the time that you change the stream. So you lose any benefits from being a task. You'll see I have a different icon. I can look at the stream and it is type development. We have been changed. All right. Hey, look, 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 we got a question. Wait a second, <laughs> how do we have a question? It's not question time yet. Oh, it's the swarm team. 
they're not allowed to do that. Hey, um, they want to use task branches, but they're telling me that they don't use streams yet. Can they still use task branches? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You can, they can create an unparented task stream, populate it from any non-stream code. Uh, it's pretty simple, but it looks like we're actually running low on time. So if you want to check out how to do it, check out online help, email tech support. They can guide you through it. Uh, all right, that sounds good. W wait a second. I have another question. If everyone starts using task branches, won't that just bloat the shadow tables and shift all those performance and locking issues over to the shadow table? Mm -hmm. But remember, task branches are supposed to just be short lived. All right. So when are you supposed? So what are you supposed to do with your task streams when you're done with them? Uh, all right. Back to PowerPoint. There are two options. First option is to delete the task branch. This removes the uh, metadata from the shadow table. So is deleting a task stream sort of like obliterating it? Uh, when we're talking about deleting a task stream, remember, we're just deleting the task stream spec, which deletes the metadata in the shadow tables, but it won't touch any of the archive files or the Revan integ records that got copied into your real tables. So you're not losing any of those files that you changed in the task stream. Got it. Uh, then I can just integrate those changes from my task stream into a shared or more stable code line like main and work like normal. Um, do I need to have a special permission to delete my task stream? Nope. It's for the everyday garden variety developer. Uh, oh, I can tell you're looking at me. You're not. You, you don't believe me. All right. <laughs> Here, look, I'm just going to show you right now. Back to the demo. I am going to delete your task branch. I say delete. Confirm. Boom. Gone. No. I wasn't ready to get rid of my task branch. I'm having separation anxiety issues, game. What if I didn't want to delete it right away? Well, it's too late for step task. But instead of deleting the branch, you can unload it into a special unload depot. It packs up all your metadata into a flat file, versions the file so you can restore it later if you've got that remorse. Oh, that works for me next time. <laughs> Well, that was a lot to digest. Uh, could you give me a cheat sheet, please? All right, so when to use task streams. If you have quick bug fixes, you have some short-term feature development, you don't need to reparent your stream, and you don't need to create children off of your stream. All right, I'm sold. I'm there. I'm going to be using these things.